hello hello grade 12s welcome back to the channel science therapy hosted by the one and only science therapist and without any further ado let's look at this question paper that we have here ah okay so we have the Gauteng province preparatory examination 2024 emotions are still high uh, we just wrote this paper recently on Monday. And then um, that's your physical science paper to chemistry. Time was three hours and then marks 150. This air question paper consisted of 16 pages and four information sheets, which I believe you made use of. So those are your instructions and information, which I believe they were read to you just before you started writing. Right, so now let's go through our question one, multiple choice questions. And then we know that uh, we are provided with four options of which we have to choose one correct answer. Then 1.1 1 .1 says, consider the flow diagram below. We have a uh, propene uh, reacting with hydrogen gas under a uh, platinum as a catalyst to produce compound X. Now knowing our reactions, SSS, USA, and then SUE, we know that uh, whenever we are trying to break the double bonds then this is addition reaction because we are moving from an alkene and then reacting it with hydrogen gas which will obviously have to give us an alkane right so that means the compound x here has to be an alkane and that option is provided by letter c okay then 1.2 says which one of the following compounds has the highest vapor pressure now, the one with the highest vapor pressure would have to be the one with the weakest intermolecular forces because we know the relationship intermolecular force is inversely proportional to the vapor pressure. Now, looking at all these uh, compounds here, we can see that they belong in the same homologous series, which uh, they are all alkanes. So uh, seeing that we cannot relate this, to uh, the type of intermolecular forces that means we have to compare based on the strength of those uh, intermolecular forces so we know that the london forces here but then the strength of the london forces depends on the chain length right so the one with the smaller or a shorter chain length rather will be the one with the weakest intermolecular forces and therefore the highest vapor pressure. So between all these elements here, which one is the shorter chain length? We can all agree that it is ethane there because it, it only has two carbon atoms. So this is the one that with the weakest intermolecular forces and therefore the highest vapor pressure. All right, then uh, we have C. It says, during the dehydration of butan 2 all represented below, a major organic compound Y is formed. Now, when we are talking about a major product formed, uh, we always uh, refer to a product whereby the functional group will be on the second carbon. So this is dehydration, which is an elimination reaction. And as we know, with elimination reaction, we are actually trying to form the double bonds. So this is whereby we are trying to produce an alkyl so from this options here we'll be looking for specifically an alkene so a can be the option because as we can all see this is an alkane there are single bonds between the carbon atoms and then c definitely incorrect is just the same as that one so that means uh, this uh, compound here did not undergo any reaction so we are left with option b and d but then remember we are trying to form a major organic compound so a major product now a major product we did state that uh, we are supposed to have our double bond there forming uh, between the second and the third carbon so this is what we are supposed to have and then which uh, which condensed formula uh, clearly represents that from here we can tell that it is b so here we can see that the double bond is forming between the first and the second carbon which is not a major product that would be a minor product but then with b it is perfect the double bond is here between the second and the third carbon so which makes it a major product right so okay option b was supposed to be the correct answer there 
now uh, the complete combustion of one mole of butane needs at least a 18 mole of o2 b 5 mole of o2 or c 7 mole of o2 or d 13 mole of o2 so this is where we get to a uh, write our combustion reaction so for combustion we know it is always an alkane that reacts with o2 to always produce carbon dioxide and wood but then our alkane we've been told it's butane so what is the molecular formula for butane according to cnh2n plus 2 which is the general formula for all alkanes then uh, we should figure out that but is 4 so this is supposed to be uh, c4 and then 2 times 4 is 8 plus 2 that's 10 so butane is c4h10 then this has to react with oxygen gas to produce carbon dioxide and wood right but then we then need to balance this equation here so that uh, we come up with the correct answer there so okay to first balance because we know our chore method says let's first balance the carbon atoms we have four this side but then here uh, we only have one so to balance that we need to put a four here how many hydrogens there are 10 this side so in order to balance we need to put a five here but then obviously this causes an imbalance in the number of our hydrogen atoms so we have four times two which is eight and then plus five eight plus five that's 13. so obviously we would need to have 13 uh, uh, moles of this but then remember for that we cannot come here and put a uh, 13 here because simply 13 here is an odd number so here we have how many oxygens we have two oxygens so there is no number that i can apply that, that i can multiply I meant to say there is no integer value that i can multiply uh, that i can multiply two with in order to get 13. so in order for me to solve that I need to write this as 13 over 2 right here right and then to find the integer value or the ratio of the O2 there I would then need to multiply both sides by 2 right we we'll then need to multiply both sides by 2 now this here will give me 2 and then C4 H10 and then this 2 will multiply with that so that I'm only left with 1302. But then the two again will multiply here. So that's eight carbon dioxide. And then here that's 10 H2O. So what were we trying to answer? Uh, how many moles of uh, oxygen do we need? And then as we can see from here, uh, this one corresponds to option D. So it was supposed to be D. And then 1.5 says the Maxwell Boltzmann energy distribution curves below show the number of particles as a function of their kinetic energy for a reaction of four different temperatures. And then the minimum kinetic energy needed for effective collusion to occur is represented by E. So we know that to be the activation energy. Now they're asking which one of these curves represent the reaction with the highest rate. Now, if we want the reaction with the highest rate, we are looking for the curve that has the largest area under its graph, right? So the largest area uh, after, obviously, the activation energy. And as we can all see here, uh, that's option D. So that's curve D. Okay, and then now let's uh, proceed to 1.6. The graph below shows the changes in X, Y, and Z over time during a reaction. And then which of the following balanced chemical equations is correct for this reaction? Now, all you need to do is, we can see this is written in the format of X, Y, Z. So your X is 2 corresponds to the 2 right there. And then your Y corresponds to the Y, to the 1. So that's 2X plus Y. And then yielding. 0.5 uh, c now obviously at this point in order to get your integer values uh, you need to divide throughout by the smallest number so 0 0.5 0 0.5 this will give us 4x 
and then here we have 2y and then this is z so this is being provided by option b so b would be correct there and then now let's uh, look at 1.7 so there is a question on acids and bases. They say HPO42 minus is an ampholite, meaning it can act as either an acid or a base. Which of the following pairs represent the conjugate acid base pair of HPO42 minus? So the same ampholite. Now, which one would represent the conjugate acid? Now, the conjugate acid, we would have to get the conjugate acid if we allow this to act as a base, right? So if we are saying our HPO, uh, HPO42 minus is a base, then we are looking for its conjugate acid. So the conjugate acid, remember, if it's a base, it needs to accept a proton, right? So that means its conjugate acid, that other side will be uh, H2PO4 and then 1 minus. So the 1 minus indicates that a proton now has been accepted, right? But then this side here, if the same uh, substance here acts as an acid, then it has to donate a proton. So if it donates a proton, then it becomes PO4, 3 minus, and this here becomes the conjugate base, right? This becomes the conjugate base. Now we want to see the option that provides that. Uh, which option provides that? So for conjugate acid, we have that. And then for conjugate base, we have uh, that. So it has to be option uh, B. Okay, nice one. So 1.8, if the concentration of a sulfuric acid solution is 1 times 10 uh, to the exponent of negative 3 mole per dm cube, what will the pH and uh, concentration of the hydroxide ions of the solution be, respectively? So to calculate the pH, uh, it is quite simple. pH is simply equals to negative log. Uh, multiplied by the hydronium ions, right? But then note, sulfuric acid here, we refer to it as a diprotic acid. So the catch was here. So this is a diprotic acid, meaning that the ratio of the concentration of the sulfuric acid to the concentration of the hydronium ions that it produces is 1 is to 2. So for every one mole of sulfuric acid that reacts, there are two moles of uh, the hydronium ions that will be produced. So that means uh, the concentration of the hydronium ions would have to be twice the concentration of the sulfuric acid. So 2 times 10 to the exponent of negative 3 mole per dm cube. So it is very important to note that you needed to first note that sulfuric acid is a diprotic acid. So you can't use that concentration. So that's negative log. And then here we have 2 times 10 to the exponent of negative 3, which if you punch into your calculator, uh, it gives you something like 2.699. So which is rounding off, it's 2.7, right? So that means your option is either A or B. But then now let's confirm what would be our concentration of uh, the hydroxide ions. Now we do know of pH plus P of OH is equals to 14, right? So the pH, remember it is being concentrated, it is being uh, calculated by the concentration of the acid. And then now we have POH, which should be calculated by the concentration of the hydroxide ions. So all this is equivalent to 14 because uh, it matches up your pH scale. So the acidic plus basic is always equal to 14 because that's your pH range. And then uh, your pOH now would have to be 14 minus 2.7. So your pOH is equals to uh, this is supposed to be 11.3, right? So to then calculate the hydroxide ions, the concentration of the hydroxide ions, we would need to say POH is equals to negative log 
multiplied by the concentration of the hydroxide ions. So this is 11.3 and the negative log uh, concentration of hydroxide ions. So to calculate concentration of hydroxide, that's just 10 to the exponent of negative 11.3. And then if you punch that into your calculator, let's check 10 to the exponent of negative 11.3. That is going to give you 5 times 10 to the exponent of negative 12 mole per dm cube. Now, which one does it correspond to? It is option B, right? So that means your answer here was supposed to be B. Okay, then uh, 1.9 says which one of the following containers can be used to store an ion 2 sulfate solution? Now, first, an ion 2 sulfate solution is uh, something like this, FeSO4. And then when it ionizes, it's Fe2 plus and then SO4 2 minus. So here we are looking for uh, something that will be a weaker reducing agent. Now, a weaker reducing agent means that this will not be able to oxidize because now you don't want a container that will oxidize, right? If it oxidizes, that means now you'll be eating rust, right? And then, uh, so from these options that we are given here, we are looking for the one that will be a weaker reducing agent. So let's check. We have Al, Mg, Nickel, and Zinc. So let me just write them here because I'm just going to scroll to the table. So between aluminum, magnesium, nickel, and zinc, we are looking for the one that will be a weaker oxidizing agent. Right, so let's go to our table. So preferably, we'll be using the 4B table. And then uh, there we go. So if we want our reducing abilities, we know that we check on the right here. And then uh, increasing reducing ability. So your in your reducing ability, as we can all see here, it increases as you go up the table, right? So if you can check here, the arrow is indicating that as you go up, the strength of the reducing uh, agents increase, right? So that means the weaker reducing agents must be down here. So we are looking for something that is down the table from the options that we have. Now, uh, our aluminum is here. So let's mark everything that we have. We have aluminum and then we have magnesium. So up there. And then what else? Uh, what else? We have uh, zinc, right? So it's still up there. But then let's check nickel. So nickel would have to be the weaker reducing agent. So if it's a weaker reducing agent, that means it will not be able to oxidize. And therefore, it makes a perfect container because now the nickel uh, ions, the Ni2 plus ions, will not oxidize, right? So will not. So Ni, uh, in fact, I'm supposed to say uh, the Ni will not oxidize will not oxidize to Ni2 plus ions. Yes, that's how you should put it. The Ni will not oxidize to Ni2 plus ions, which makes it a perfect container if it doesn't oxidize. So you don't want a container that uh, will rust. Okay, so uh, we have our 1.10 now, the last one. It says, consider the following reaction which takes place in a galvanic cell. The net cell potential when uh, this cell reaches equilibrium will be what? So let's check here. So at this point, we want to check a uh, two. So the one that goes CR2 plus uh, with CR3 plus, and then also the one that goes CN4 plus and CN2 plus, right? So between the two, we want to check which one is anode and which one is cathode. And therefore, we calculate our EMF. And then, okay. So again, we go back to the table, 4B, preferably. So with 4B, we know that the first one that will appear is the anode. And the second one that will appear is the cathode. Now, the catch here is that you need to 
uh, choose the ones that are exactly uh, the same as those ones, right? So we can see one here, 0 0.16. And then now let's look for this one here, the CR. So if we can check, it should be uh, up here. Yes, there we go. But then already we know the one that appears uh, first there has to be the anode and this one has to be the cathode. Now to calculate our E cell, we know that uh, this is E cell is equals to E cathode minus E anode, right? And then uh, that means we are going to say our E cathode, as we can see here, it's 0 0.16 and then minus our E anode is negative 0 0.41. Then all you just do is simply grab your calculator and punch that 0 0.16 plus, because of the negative and negative, 0 0.41. And then this is going to give us uh, 0. So is that all 0 0.15? Okay. So 0 0.15 and not 1.6. So this is supposed to give me 0 0.56 positive, right? Then, yeah, correct. So I had taken the wrong one there. And then this is 0 0.56. Now let's go and look for the options and see which one corresponds to that. Then uh, going back here. Then which one shows positive 0 0.56? That's option A. So option A would have to be the correct one. Okay, nice. So that's how you were supposed to tackle your multiple choice questions. So it was a pretty fair uh, multiple choice question. Uh, nothing really, really difficult there. Yeah, so let's now uh, go to question number two, organic chemistry. Okay, so now we are on question two. It says um, the letters A to F in the table below represent six organic compounds, right? And then as we already know the strategy, the first thing that we have to do is try to identify the homologous series to which each and every organic compound here belongs. So this here we can see, we can see that it is just a a straight chain a alkane, which is a hydrocarbon, so saturated hydrocarbon. So that has to be an alkane. And then with butanol here, because of the suffix, we can tell that this is an aldehyde. And then compound C, because of the OH there, we know that this is an alcohol. And then D, because of the bromine atoms, we know that this should be a halo alkane, right? And then uh, right here we have E, and then we can see the double bond oxygen in between the carbon that is bonded to two other carbons here. So this should be a ketone because it gives us a carbonyl group. And then F here, where we cannot really tell because we are not given X, Y, and Z. But then uh, experience tells us that this could only be carboxylic acids, or esters. Now we can say the ketone and aldehyde, but then um, chances that chances are th uh, that is not right. Might be a carboxylic acid or an ester. Then two point one is compound A saturated or unsaturated hydrocarbon. Give a reason for the answer. Now looking at this one here, we will we can tell that it is saturated because a uh, with alkanes, we know that there are single bonds between the carbon atoms. So your reason here should be uh, because there are single bonds, single bonds between uh, the carbon atoms. Right. And then um, 2.2 .2 says write down the letters that represent each of the following. Which one is a ketone? Uh, as we can all see, it's E. Which one is a haloalkane? That's definitely D. And then two functional isomers. When it comes to isomers, remember cake. 
right? So carboxylic acid, functional isomer to an ester, aldehyde, functional isomer to a ketone. So that means here, the two functional isomers would have to be your aldehyde and your ketone. So which is B and E, right? So there we go. Then 2.3 says consider compound C. Is compound C a primary, secondary, or tertiary alcohol? Give a reason for the answer. Now looking at uh, C here, um, the carbon that is bonded to the OH is only bonded to one other carbon, so which makes it a primary alcohol. So that one should be a primary alcohol. So our answer there is primary, and the reason for that is because uh, the carbon, the carbon uh, bonded to the OH group is bonded to one carbon, to one carbon, right? So that's it. And then 2.3.2 says, write down the structural formula and IUPAC name of a, of a chain isomer of compound C, of a what? A chain isomer, right? So note that. But then when we are looking at a compound C, so meant to say not A, compound C, when we are looking at compound C, we can see that it is a branched al alcohol, right? Now, the chain isomer would obviously be a straight chain alcohol because with chain isomers, these are molecules with the same molecular formula, but different types of chains. So if this here is a branched chain, that means the chain isomer that we should draw should be a straight chain alcohol, but then should also have the same number of carbon atoms, hydrogen atoms, and also oxygen atoms. So that's C. C, so four of those. Our OH here, we can tell that it is in carbon number one. If we go one, two, three, this is carbon number one there. So we should still keep it in carbon number one because remember, it's only a chain isomer, not a positional isomer. Right, so now we make this one straight. And then also, let's not forget, they said also the IUPAC name. So what is the IUPAC name of this alcohol now that we have drawn? It should be butanol, right? So I'm aware that some of you can would just write a butanol, but then always indicate the position of the OH group there. Indicate the position of the hydroxyl group. Okay, and then now let's uh, proceed to another question. So there's still more of these questions. Now 2.4.1, uh, let's check, is it that question? Write down the IUPAC name for compound D. Right, write down the IUPAC name for compound D. Now what is the IUPAC for compound D IUPAC name? Uh, first thing that we need to do is obviously find our longest chain. So one, two, three, four, five, six, Let's confirm if we go down, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So this here would have to be our longest chain. So it is not always the straight chain that has to be the longest chain. Always confirm if you have to bend it, uh, are there more carbons? Then obviously now we have to worry about numbering. So we always number from the side where we have the closest disturbance. So if we number from this side, that's one, two, three, we're only seeing our methyl branch in carbon number three. But from this side, that's one, two, and then immediately we see a halogen there. So that means we will choose to number from this side. Then one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So this should be, the bromine is in carbon two and carbon three. So this should be two, three, but since there are two of those, we need to say dibromo and then dash. Indicate the position of the methyl. So that's five. And then methyl, the seven means what? Hept. So heptane. So heptane because this is a haloalkane. So the suffix is ane. 
then uh let's now uh proceed to still yet another question now name of the functional group of compound b let's look what is compound b compound b we said this one is an aldehyde so what is the functional uh what is the functional uh, group of the aldehyde so the functional group of aldehyde we know it to be the formal group the formal group so always remember that formal group that's the name of the functional group of an aldehyde so note that they did not say homologous series they did not say name of the homologous series they said of the functional group and then a, a sample of compound F contains 40% carbon, 53.3% oxygen, and X% percent hydrogen. So now from this, we can tell that the first thing that we need to figure out is the percentage for the hydrogen, right? Because we are not given. So that means uh, knowing that the percentage composition here of this compound will have to be 100%. That means we can calculate that by saying 100% minus 53.3% uh, minus the 40%, right? And then when we put that into our calculator, we get 6.7%. So this becomes the percentage uh, by mass of hydrogen, right? So to then calculate, remember we are given this here in the format of C X H Y O Z, right? So let's put it in that format as well. So to calculate, we know the first step. Remember, this is taking us all the way back to grade 11, having to calculate the empirical formula and then having to find the molecular formula. So this is from your grade 11. So there was a little throwback here, uh, right there, as I've told you that you also have to mind your stoichiometry from a uh, grade 11 because they do throw a bit of it into the exam so now to calculate the number of moles of carbon we need to say that's mass over the molar mass and then the mass we are going to take the percentage so we simply take this percentage as as if it is 40 gram right and then that's 40 and then your molar mass from the periodic table divided by 12. And then if you punch that into your calculator, that's 3.33 mole, right? Now let's calculate the number of moles of hydrogen. So the, the mass over the molar mass, I gain that percentage as the mass, 6.7 divided by 1. This is going to give us 6.7 mole, right? And then uh, for the oxygen, that's mass over the molar mass, and then oxygen we've been given 53.3, then that divided by 16. So it should give us 3.33 as well, right? And then we know the second step is to divide by the smallest number of moles. So to find the ratio of carbon, that's 3.33 divided by 3.33. To find the ratio of hydrogen, that's 6.7 divided by 3.33. And then to find the ratio of oxygen, 3.33 divided by 3.33. And then this is 1, 2, 1. So that means your empirical formula now, empirical uh, formula has to be C H and then O. We know there's a one here, but then we are not done. They're not looking for the empirical formula. They are looking for the molecular formula. So the next step after finding the empirical formula is to calculate uh, the molar mass of that empirical formula. So CH2O, right? So we want to calculate the empirical formula for this. So that's 12 plus 2 times 1 plus 16, which is supposed to give us 30 grams per mole. But then now what do we do? We take this 30 grams per mole and divide it to the molar mass, right, of that particular compound. So 60 divided by 30, and then we get to this two here is a multiplier, right? So multiply is where the ratios of the empirical formula. So now the molecular formula will have 
to be C2H4O2. So that was supposed to be your final answer there. C2H4O2. Okay, nice. Then 2.5.2 uh, says write down the IUPAC names of the two organic compounds that will have this molecular formula. You will remember that I did mention that that can only be an ester or a carboxylic acid because of experience, guys. If you are experienced with these questions, you already know. Okay, then uh, now we know that this because of the general formula here. The general formula of esters and carboxylic acids are like this, right? So, yeah, obviously, CNH2N and then uh, O2 there. So, we, we already know that uh, it's like that. Okay, then, if this is, if this has to be an ester now, what ester would be this? Obviously, there are two uh, carbon atoms, so that means it would have to be methyl on the alcohol side and methyl on the ethanoic, uh, or on the carboxylic acid side, right? So this would have to be methyl, methyl methanoate, if it was to be an ester, right? So methyl methanoate. But if it were to be a carboxylic acid, if it were to be a carboxylic acid, then uh, with two carbons there, it would have to be ethanoic acid. Ethanoic acid. And then these two here are also functional isomers, right, from cake. Okay, so that's how you could have uh, solved that one. And then all that question for a total of 18 marks. So I hope you bagged that one. And then if you made uh, mistakes, please note, please note those mistakes and make sure that next time it doesn't dribble you. And then, okay, question three says the table below shows the boiling points of four organic compounds represented by the letters A to D of comparable molecular masses. So always note that I said they will always try to keep the molar mass constant, even if it is not exactly uh, equal, but then they will try to have relative molecular mass. So as you can see here, 86, 86, and then 88, 88. So this is round about the same molecular mass in Dangadis. Then uh, 3.1, Compounds A and B are structural isomers. Define the term structural isomers. Note that they only said structural isomers. They were not specific as to what type of structural isomers. Now we know that uh, there are three types of structural isomers. You have your chain isomers, your positional isomers, and functional isomers. To be specific, A and B would have to be chain isomers. They belong in the same uh, homologous series and then the only difference we can tell that this one is branched but this one is a straight uh, chain molecule but then here we are only required to define what is a structural isomer so for structural isomer we say these are organic compounds organic compounds with the same molecular formula molecular formula but different structural formulae right so we are not being specific about uh, the difference in the structural formulae so we know that the difference in the structural formulae can be uh, in terms of the chain, the position of the functional group, or uh, the functional groups themselves. Then, okay, 3.1.2 says the boiling point of compound B is higher than the boiling point of compound A. Explain the difference in boiling points, three marks. Now, we already know, if we are given that, this is where we need to apply our ISCE. Why? Because we are comparing compounds that are in the same homologous series. And I've already uh, made you note that if we are comparing compounds in the same homologous series, the method is I, 
ISCE, where you have to identify the type of intermolecular forces present in both of those compounds. And then you speak of the surface area. You speak of, uh, you compare the, you compare the strength of the intermolecular forces. And then finally, you speak of the energy required to overcome the intermolecular forces. So that means here, um, to follow that method, so this is where you get your marks, guys. That uh, that method is not just from thin air. This is where you are marked. So they will they will check whether you mentioned the type of intermolecular forces. Did you speak about the surface area or the structure? Did you compare the strength of the intermolecular forces? And did you speak about NH? So it's coming from knowing where your marks are. Then okay, uh, we'll say both compound. A and B have London forces. Both compound A and B have London forces. But then we can say compound B has a larger surface area than compound A. Then compound a now we know the reason for that is because b is a straight chain and then therefore there is a uh, much dispensation of those uh, london forces but then with a here it is a spherical molecule so that means it has a smaller surface area right and a smaller chain length or a shorter chain length which uh, obviously leads to a smaller surface area and therefore the london forces cannot act on their full extent right so at this point we're going to say the london forces the london forces in compound b in compound b are stronger are stronger than those in compound a than those in compound A, right? Which means more energy is required to overcome the intermolecular forces in compound B. The intermolecular forces in compound B. And then you can conclude, thus, it has a higher boiling point. Thus, it has a higher boiling point. Right. So that's how you go about it. Now, I know that you can say uh, you have many points for three marks, but then it is always better to fully explain everything. So do not leave anything outside and then if they... If they don't award marks for that, they can just skip it and give the mark for where they award marks. But then it is always the best approach to just put everything there in clear sight uh, so that you are safe. Right. Then uh, 3.2 says, define the term vapor pressure. So what is vapor pressure? We say this is the pressure exerted by a vapor at equilibrium with its liquid in a closed system, in a closed system. Right, so there we go. And then uh, 3.3 says, which one of the compounds B or C will have a higher vapor pressure? Give a reason for the answer. Now, I always made you note this question to say that if they ask you about another physical properties, when they gave you just uh, the boiling point or other uh, physical property, then you have to note the relationship between those two physical properties. Right, so now, 
we have boiling point but then they're asking us about the vapor pressure so obviously here it is very important that we know the relationship between boiling point and vapor pressure is inversely proportional so to interpret this question that means if they're looking for the compound with the higher vapor pressure they're actually looking for the one with the lower boiling point right so higher vapor pressure leads to lower boiling point so this is between compound b and c now we want to check the boiling points and then we can see that uh, b here is the one with a lower boiling point right so that means we are going to say for 3.3 .3, that's b and then the reason for that it has the lowest boiling point right it has the lowest boiling point now if you don't mention this you can also mention the fact that hexane here has a weak intermolecular forces uh, so it has weak intermolecular forces it has weak intermolecular forces because now b has london forces but then c here has dipole dipole forces now we know dipole dipole forces are much stronger than the london forces so obviously the weaker the intermolecular forces the higher the vapor uh, the vapor pressure so intermolecular forces also inversely proportional to vapor pressure so the weaker the intermolecular forces the higher the vapor pressure because less energy is required to overcome the intermolecular forces right then uh, let's now proceed 3.4 says consider compounds c and d so let's look at c and d c and d that's your methyl propanoate and ester and then d pentan one all and alcohol right so uh, they say will the boiling point of compound d be uh, x 75.5 degrees celsius or y 135.5 degrees celsius right only x or y now uh, looking at this uh, we've already concluded that this is an alcohol so it has hydrogen bonds but this here has dipole dipole forces now we know that hydrogen bonds uh, have what are stronger are much more stronger than uh, your what you call your dipole dipole forces right so if this one has stronger intermolecular forces the relationship between the intermolecular forces The relationship between intermolecular force and boiling point is directly proportional right so obviously the one with this with stronger intermolecular forces will have a higher boiling point so in that sense we know that uh, the boiling point in y would have to be greater than the boiling point uh, of compound c here so which option gives us that is it y or z and then as we can see here the option that gives us a number that is greater than that one is y so 3.4.1 our solution is supposed to be y right and then 3.4.2 says explain the answer to question 3.4.1 and then uh, because we are comparing compounds that are in different homologous series we say the method that we are going to use now is ice right so I, I C E. Now this means that you have to first identify the type of intermolecular forces in each of these uh, compounds, and then you compare the strength of those intermolecular forces, and then finally you speak of the energy required to overcome the intermolecular forces. So again, to go about with that format, this is what you are supposed to do, right? So we are going to say. Uh, for 3.4.2 now compound compound a uh, c has dipole dipole forces right and then a uh, compound d which is the alcohol has hydrogen 
Now, compare the strength of the intermolecular forces. Hydrogen bonds, hydrogen bonds are stronger than dipole-dipole forces. Which means more energy, more energy is required to overcome the intermolecular forces, the intermolecular forces in compound D. Right. And then, that's compound D has a higher boiling point. So this is just your conclusion here. Right. So it's just sim simply confirming why you chose Y as your option. <laughs> so, okay, that's how you were supposed to go about answering these questions. So for 13 marks, I hope you also begged that one. And if there's something that uh, was a bit of a trouble to you, make sure that you note it right now and you don't make the same mistake again in your final exam. So guys, there's no time to relax. At this point, you should be picking up your books and just uh, start to fix your mistakes because in one month's time, you are starting again with your exam. Then question four, consider the following sequence of organic reactions labeled A to E, right? So again, when we come to this point here, I said always remember to write SSS, USA, and then SUE, right? So saturated to saturated is substitution, unsaturated to saturated addition, and then saturated to unsaturated elimination. So here, breaking double bonds, but then here, forming double bonds. Right. So that's all you need and a and also to know the reaction conditions, of course. Then write down the type of reaction that occurs at A. Let's look. So as we can see here, the CH3, CH, CH2, this here indicates that this is a double bond there. So if you want to really confirm if it's a double bond, then you just have to draw that one out. So you have CH3 and then follow by saying CH and then follow by saying CH and then so that's CH2. Now, obviously from here, you can tell that uh, we need one more bond here in order for this to be complete. So this is where the double bond comes in, right? So now, from this alkene, and then we are reacting it with HBr to form co compound X. Obviously, if we are moving from an alkene, breaking the double bond, and then we are going to a saturated compound, we know that to be an addition reaction, right? So you don't have to be specific here in terms of what type of addition it is. But then if you are interested, it is hydrohalogenation because we are actually adding a hydrogen and a halogen. So that would be for 4.1.1, it's addition. And then if you want to be specific, it's hydrohalogenation. But then remember I said, do not try to be smart and be specific here. You only, uh, you only are going to be specific if they say the type of substitution you see like this one. That one forces you to be specific. But other than that, try to just keep it simple. Then 4.1.2, this is C. So this is more like it's going back here. We know the opposite of an addition reaction is an elimination. So this would be a dehydrohalogenation reaction. So if we are taking it back, so that is an elimination reaction. Again, don't try to be smart and write this. So to be more specific, it's dehydrohalogenation. 
And then uh, 4.2 says write down the name of formula of the catalyst for reaction D, right? So a uh, reaction D there, what kind of a uh, reaction is this one? So because we can see the C, uh, an increase in the number of hydrogen atoms there, that means they reacted this with hydrogen uh, gas or two molecules, uh, a molecule of hydrogen, so a diatomic molecule, of hydrogen then uh, this is supposed to be what we know the reaction condition for this type of reaction here which is called hydration so d is what we call hydration if you look at your notes based on uh, the reaction conditions you will soon know that we need platinum there to act as a catalyst so platinum or pt remember they said name or formula so we use platinum uh, as a catalyst then 4.3 says reaction b is a substitution reaction that takes place in the presence of water it is a substitution now we already know the type of substitution that takes place in the presence of water they can only be one the one that i always uh, remind you of and i did hint people on this one to say that they will always ask you about the hydrolysis reaction when it comes to substitution so that one has to be hydrolysis right then 4.3.2 two other reaction conditions for this reaction also the reaction conditions you need what mild heat mild heat and dilute strong base dilute strong base and then that's your your dilute strong base can be in the form of sodium hydroxide potassium hydroxide or lithium hydroxide you only need to say dilute uh, strong base right and then 4.3.3 says are you peg name of the major product y a uh, major product y weighs y this is it here so at this point we have our so here that means we have our compound x that is coming from here and then we want to form an alcohol here on this right so note that already here we have an alkane and then we are trying to form a, an alcohol so we are still on hydrolysis right so to form a major product now a major product no problem i always made you hint to this to say that if you are forming the major product just remember to put your substituent in the second carbon so here you only have three carbons so that means you have to put your oh in the uh, middle carbon there so that's all you do to form uh, the major product so that's all you do so for 4.3.3 they want the water the iupac name so if now we have to put our carbon in the in this carbon here to make it a secondary alcohol then this has to be propane you all right so look to that that's how you form a major product and then uh, they say use the structural formula to write a balanced equation for reaction b showing the formation of alcohol y again i said when it comes to drawing structural formulas take hint they will either show hydrolysis or uh, your hydro your dehydrohalogenation so again we are having our uh, complete equation like this so our compound x our compound x coming from here would have to be the bromine there and then we had reacted this with water so h2o and uh, not water uh, the the dilute sodium hydroxide uh, so yeah so you can either react it others might react it with potassium hydroxide as long as it's a dilute strong base so let me indicate here this is dilute and then uh, that means here we are performing a substitution reaction so in the place of br you put oh right and then there you go now the br that came out from there We'll have to react with the sodium here and form a byproduct sodium bromide right 
And that's all you were supposed to indicate there. That's all you were supposed to indicate. Reaction E is a reaction between minor product, uh, alcohol Z, and the carboxylic acid to form an ester. Right. So now they're saying reaction E is a minor product, so meaning that uh, the substituent there is not on is not on the second carbon. Obviously, we know that in order to form a carboxylic acid, we need to always have a primary alcohol. And the primary alcohol is not a major product. It is a minor product because the OH there is not on the second carbon, but rather on the first carbon. Right. So now the same reaction E is a reaction between minor product alcohol C and the carboxylic acid to form an est. Name of this type of reaction. So I always said this, guys, that your esterification question, when it comes to question four, you will always find it being the last portion of the question because esterification is not substitution, is not addition, is not elimination. The trend is always the same, guys. It doesn't matter uh, whether it's a free state paper or a Western Cape paper. The format is always like that. Then 4.5.2, name of the inorganic compound formed during this reaction. We know that with esterification, we then form a byproduct water, right? So they said name. Don't write H2O. We are supposed to say water. And then uh, 4.5.2, name, again, name of the catalyst needed for this reaction. We know that the name of the catalyst is sulfuric acid, right? So again, if you write H, if you had written H2SO4 here, penalized, right? Because they said name. Then 4.5.2, are you peg name of the functional isomer of the ester formed? The functional isomer, right? Now, if we have formed an ester, again, let's go back to cake. An ester is a functional isomer 2A, carboxylic acid, right? So, okay, let's check. We wanted the name of the functional isom of the ester formed. So, obviously, the first thing that we need to know is uh, this ester that has been formed. So, the ester that we have here, that's one, two, three, and then uh, which side is there? Is the alcohol and which side is the carboxylic? So, okay, uh, OO here, this has to be the carboxylic acid side. And then this one has to be the alcohol side. So obviously, if we want, if we want uh, the carboxylic acid, we are simply concerned about counting the number of carbon atoms in total. One, two, three, uh, four, five, six. I, I think I counted correctly. One, two, three, uh, four, five, six. Yes, because they indicated one, two, three here. One, two, three. Okay, fine. So that means. Uh, the carboxylic acid that I would have to form here. What six? It's it's hex, right? So hex is six. So it has to be hexanoic acid. Oh yeah, hexanoic acid. Right. Now they're saying draw the structural formula of the functional group. Guys, note this: the structural formula of the functional group of the carboxylic acid. They don't want you to draw that carboxylic acid. They just want you to draw the functional group, right? So the functional group. And then uh, the functional group of a carboxylic acid, we know it to be this, right? So that's the functional group. So you just draw that skeleton there, and then you are done. That is the functional group of carboxylic acid. And then they did not ask for the name, but then we know it as the carboxyl group, right? So that's the functional group. And that's how you were supposed to go about uh, answering these questions here for a whooping 17 marks. So uh, your organic chemistry was not that really bad. You could have just got yourself those marks, all of them, right? So provided that you did not make any mistakes, you were just supposed to bag everything there. But then I hope if you made mistakes, you have learned from your mistakes, and then uh, you are much better prepared for your final exam.
Okay, so we have question five on reaction rates. It says learners are asked to investigate the rate at which 0.3 gram of impure calcium carbonate will react with an excess of one mole per dm cube hydrochloric acid at room temperature to produce carbon dioxide gas. We know that the produce of the carbon dioxide gas always tells us of our reaction rate, right? So we judge by the, our collection of the carbon dioxide gas uh, as to know whether the reaction rate was faster or slower. The equation for the reaction is as follows there. The graph below represents the volume of carbon dioxide produced at regular time intervals. Then they say 5.1, write down an investigative question for this experiment. Now, obviously, this has to do with, uh, this has to do with the concentration and the reaction rate because if we are putting in that impure calcium carbonate we are simply just trying to increase the concentration of uh, the particles and therefore leading to a higher reaction rate so our investigative question here would be what is the relationship what is the relationship between the concentration and the reaction rate and the reaction rate or rate of reaction and then obviously it's a question so you put a question mark then 5.1.2 says a controlled variable so which variable must be controlled here obviously if there are two uh make sure that the the results of this inv investigation are valid and reliable they would have to make sure that they use the same mass so they have to use the same mass of calcium carbonate so the mass of calcium carbonate would have to be kept constant and then again to make sure that the concentration is the only factor they would have to make sure that they maintain the same temperature uh, throughout this uh, experiment or investigation right and then also again another factor could be the state of division remember we are working with a solid here which is uh, your calcium carbonate so the state of division would have to be kept constant so your state of division we know that we are talking about the surface area of that impure symbol right okay so either one of this would have been correct and then 5.1.3 says the dependent variable for this investigation now we know what are they trying to investigate the rate right so that's your reaction rate or you can say rate of reaction so reaction rate and then that's how you were supposed to go about with those ones and let's now continue and see more questions uh here they say with reference to the graph how will the rate of reaction between the time zero seconds 220 seconds compare with the reaction rate between time 30 seconds 250 seconds now we know that we determine the reaction rate by simply looking at the gradient right so from 0 to 20 seconds we can see that our gradient here is a bit steep right but then if we can just look between uh, 30 to 50 seconds what will be happening to our straight line if we are to put it there so we can see that our graph there is starting to become smooth right so the steeper the gradient the higher the reaction rate and the smoother the gradient the slower the reaction rate so that means we would say between a uh, zero seconds to 20 seconds the reaction rate the reaction rate is faster than uh, between uh, 30 seconds than between 30 seconds to 50 seconds where the reaction rate is slow where the reaction rate is slow right so that's how you would put that one there and then uh, again another one 
keep them coming. What conclusion can be drawn from the graph between time 60 seconds to 70 seconds? 60 to 70, we can see that right there between 60 seconds and 70 seconds, our graph now starts to become a constant graph like that. So no longer increasing, which obviously we know the conclusion to this. This means that the reaction has came to completion. The reaction has came to a stop. So the reaction has came to a stop. Now the reason for that is because the limiting reagent, the limiting reagent, which in this case, since they did mention that HCl is in excess, that means the limiting reagent we are referring to is the calcium carbonate. The limiting reagent calcium carbonate is completely used up. Completely used up. Right. Okay, so we know limiting reagent is the substance that would be used up completely in a chemical reaction. So that's how you are supposed to answer that. And then now they are saying, uh, cal use the graph to calculate the mass of calcium carbonate that reacted. The molar volume is 24 dm cube at room temperature. Now we already know if we are given the molar the molar volume, the formula that we have to always use is the one that goes N is equals to V over Vm. It is the only formula where we can substitute the molar volume. The molar volume is the Vm then. So I always made you note that uh, when it comes to reaction rate, you would have to always remember to use that formula. Right. Okay, so now note that the graph here, they say the graph below represents the volume of carbon dioxide produced at regular time intervals. Remember we said the way in which we are able uh, to tell about our reaction rate or to find conclusions on the reaction rate is by looking at the number or at the amount of volume of gas that has been collected, right? It is the only way to tell about uh, the reaction rate here. So the only gas that we have is carbon dioxide. And this formula here only works for gases, right? So obviously, uh, from this graph here, let's read the maximum volume, volume of carbon dioxide that was collected. The maximum volume of carbon dioxide that was collected uh, before the completion here was the 25, was 25 centimeter cube, right? So V is 25 centimeter cube. But then in order to use that formula, we need our volume in dm cube. So we'll have to divide this by 1000. And then this will give us 0 0.025 dm cube. Right. Now, at this point, we can calculate and say N is 0 0.025, but then our VM we've been given there, right? Remember, they did mention that our VM is 24. So let's divide by 24 here. And then punching that into our calculator, we have a 1.042 times 10 to the exponent of negative 3 mole. So for those of you that, uh, that it, it has written in normal form, you are supposed to just write all of that number there or simply just change your calculator to a scientific form so that you can have it like I do here. And then now, remember what we are trying to calculate is the mass of calcium carbonate. So now that we have the number of moles, we know step number two. So all we are applying here is basic stoichiometry whereby we know step number one, calculate the number of moles. Step number two, compare the molar ratio. Then step number three, calculate for the required value. So this was your step number one. Then step number two, uh, this is where we say, what is the ratio of calcium carbonate? So the ratio of the number of moles of calcium carbonate to the number of moles of carbon dioxide. And as we can see from our coefficients here is one is two. One. But then the number of moles of carbon dioxide was uh, 1.042. So if it's 1 is to 1, then we can conclude that also the number of moles of calcium carbonate needs to be the same value there. 1.042 times 10 to the exponent of negative 3 mole. Right. So same ratio, same number of moles. Then step number 3 now. This is where then we calculate for the required value. We have to go back and reread the question. Use the graph to calculate what? The mass. The what? 
the mass of calcium carbonate that reacted. So that means at this point, we need to say, okay, to calculate the mass that reacted, we have our formula M is equals to N times the molar mass. So obviously this has been taken from N is equals to M over big M. So just manipulated to make M the subject of the formula. Then 1.042 times 10 to the exponent of negative 3. Then what is the molar mass of calcium carbonate? Now experience will tell you that it is 100 because uh, in most of the cases, that's uh, the, the substance that you work with when it comes to when it comes to these questions here. And then when you multiply there, it will give you 0 0.10 four gram right which if you round it off to two decimal places you only wrote 1.10 which should be correct because it's in line with your exam instruction then uh, calculate the percentage purity of the calcium carbonate which reacted in the above reaction now percentage purity this is also a throwback to your grade 11 so you will remember that percentage purity we say it's what the mass of the pure sample or the reacted sample over the mass of the impure sample. So the pure sample is the one that reacted, right? Then a uh, times one liter. Then, okay, pure, we did calculate the one, 0 0.104 from the previous question. But then reading here, we saw that they said, uh, the impure sample was 0 0.3, right? So the impure sample was 0 0.3. So we need to divide that by 0 0.3, then multiply by 100. And then, okay, uh, when we patch that into our calculator, it becomes 34.67%. So, right. Awesome. And then uh, let's let's see other ones so this question was not that bad though then uh, the learners repeat their in investigation by using 0 0.3 gram of the same impure calcium carbonate but increase the concentration of hydrochloric acid to two mole per dm cube so now they increase the concentration now we are now we are getting to why we said uh, the relationship is, uh, I mean, the investigative question is the relationship between the concentration and reaction rate. Then 5.6.1, how will the gradient of the graph change when the concentration of the acid is increased? Now, obviously, when they're talking about the gradient, the gradient relates to the reaction rate. So it's more like what will happen to the reaction rate if concentration has to be increased. We know that reaction rate increases, therefore the graph will become steep, right? the graph will become steeper, right? So there will be a greater gradient now. So 5.6.1. Then 5.6.2, now it's saying, use the collision theory to explain how an increase in concentration affects the rate of reaction. And then this is how you should put it an increase in concentration, an increase in concentration increases the number of particles, the number of particles per unit volume, right? So point number one. And then now, point number two, you will say, this leads to what? More effective collisions per unit time. More effective collisions per unit time. And thus increasing the rate of reaction. Thus increasing the rate of reaction, right? So it is very important that you say increases concentration uh, I mean, the number of particles increases per unit volume. More effective collisions per unit time, increasing the rate of reaction. So that's the three-month there. 
So make sure that you know to that. Make sure that you know to that. Okay, so we have question six. It says potassium dichromate is formed when nitric acid is slowly added to a potassium chromate solution. The chromate ions uh, in the solution reach equilibrium with the dichromate ions according to the following balanced ionic equation. Then 6.1 says define the term chemical equilibrium. And then quickly we know that one is a dynamic equilibrium. when the rate of the forward reaction is equal to the rate of the reverse reaction. Right, so nice. And then a uh, 6.2.1 is saying now, a concentrated nitric acid solution is now added to this reaction mixture, meaning that they are increasing concentration. So increasing concentration, obviously they are increasing the concentration on the reactant side. Now what color change will be observed in the mixture? Choose from more yellow, to more orange. Now, uh, if we increase the concentration on the reactant side, that means we'll be favoring the forward reaction. And if forward reaction is favored, that means we will have more of this uh, ions here, the dichromate ions, which will change the color to more orange. So that's more orange. And then now we are supposed to explain the answer to question 6.2.1 in terms of Lee Chattadiya's principle. So in order to explain that, we are going to say 6.2.2, uh, the nitric acid, which we know it to be a strong acid, ionizes completely in the solution ionizes completely in the solution uh, thereby increasing the concentration remember this is an acid concentration of the H plus ions right the hydrogen ions so it increases the concentration of the hydrogen ions here because we know an acid is a proton donor, right? Or it produces hydrogen ions. And then with that being said, we'll say, uh, therefore, the forward reaction is favored. Remember, if now there's more of this, the forward reaction is favored. then uh, to decrease the concentration to decrease the concentration of the CRO42 minus right uh, ions and then obviously if the concentration of this decreases uh, which is those ones are yellow, right? So forward reaction is favored to decrease the concentration of the CRO42 minus ions. And then therefore, the concentration of CRO42 minus ions decreases and concentration so if those ones, if the reactants are being used up, they are being used up so that more products can be formed. Remember, if you increase the concentration on the reactant side, the, the reaction that will promote the using up of those reactants will be favored, right? 
So remember, according to Lichardler's principle, when we increase the concentration of a reactant, then we must favor the reaction that will use up uh, those reactants. So hence, the forward direction has been favored. So the concentration of this reactant increases, and therefore the concentration of this product here increases. And the concentration of the CR2072 minus increases. And then obviously, uh, this is what? Orange. So leading to our solution being more orange. So that was to conclude on that. So leading to our solution being more orange. And then, okay, so that's how you were supposed to put it there. So make sure that you follow that format. So this was a bit of a mixture of uh, your acids and bases and also your de Chandler's principle, right? So we kind of know that chemical equilibrium questions can be a bit odd sometimes. When the temperature of the original mixture is increased, it is observed. It is observed that the color of the mixture changes to yellow. So if the mixture changes to yellow, this indicates that the reverse reaction has been favored, right? Now they are asking the question, is the forward reaction endothermic or exothermic? According to the Chadler, we know that an increase in temperature always favors the endothermic reaction. But then here we have observed that the reverse reaction is the one that has been favored. So which obviously means that the forward reaction would have to be exothermic since it was not favored by this increase in temperature. Remember, exothermic is only favored by a decrease in temperature. Now, they say explain the answer to question 6.3.1 in terms of Lichatalia's principle. So this is what you are supposed to say. So number one is you say an increase in temperature, an increase in temperature favors the endothermic reaction. This is a fact, favors the endothermic reaction. Now, we are going to say the solution tends, the solution or the mixture changes to yellow indicating the reverse reaction was favored, indicating the reverse reaction was favored and therefore reverse reaction is endothermic is endothermic and forward reaction is exothermic. So that's it. That's the full explanation. So that's how you were supposed to uh, just go about that one. An increase in temperature, we know factually, it favors the endothermic reaction. But then here in the statement, we are told that the mixture changes to yellow, which indicates that the reverse reaction was the one that was favored. Therefore, the reverse reaction is endothermic since we say that uh, the temperature was increased and an increase favors endothermic. And therefore, if the reverse reaction is endothermic, then it goes without saying the forward reaction has to be exothermic. And then again, three marks in the back. Okay, then we come to the main question. We know there is no chemical equilibrium without that question that says calculate the Kc. So now uh, we know to start with that one, we have to have our rice table. Have our rice table. And then let's look at uh, our reactants here. So we want to check if everything qualifies here to be in this table here. But then we can see H2O here is a liquid. And then we know that uh, 
liquids do not make it to the KC calculation, right? Because the KC it's only for uh, solutions or substances in aqueous or gaseous state, right? So liquids, solid, they do not make it to the KC. So that means only these three qualify. They're all aquas. And then there we go. So let's break this into three compartments. Right. Then that will be our ratio. Y initial. Our change. Y equilibrium number of moles. And then C is equals to N over V. So ratio. Initial. Number of moles then change in the number of moles and then we have equilibrium number of moles and then we have c is equals to n over v which will be representing our concentration now uh, let's just write here up here we have cr 042 minus and then i will also put h plus and then I will drop a CR207, 2 minus. Now the ratios are the coefficients. So that means I have 2, 2, 1, right? So now let's uh, go to our question. It says uh, 11 mole CR02 minus and X mole H plus are initially added together to make a 0 0.5 dm cube solution and allow to react. So initially, we have 11 moles of this. So we have 11 here. And then uh, this case here, we have what? X, right? And then at this point, uh, we don't have anything here on the product because this is our only product since uh, we have disqualified this one. So this is our only product. And then initially, obviously, we won't be having any product, right? And then they say, when the reaction reaches equilibrium, the solution contains 9 mole per dm cube of Cr2O2 minus, right? So 9 mole, note that this is the concentration, right? So at equilibrium, let's put it where? Uh, it's supposed to go in here. So this is the product, 9, right? Meaning that we can find this one here using our formula, C is equals to N over V. So let's say C is equals to N over V. Our concentration is 9. And then N, our volume, remember, we are given it is what? 0 0.5, right? So if we say 9 multiplied by 0 0.5, this is going to give us 4.5 mole, right? So there, we're going to put our 4.5 mole. But then if we are looking at the change here, we know that uh, in here on the reactant side, we have to say uh, to find the one at equilibrium, it is always I plus C. So that means it was supposed to be zero plus something to give us 4.5, which means it is plus 4.5. But then all these other numbers here on the change block can now be found using the ratio. So remember, we always said the change block relates to the ratio there, right? So that means in other words, uh, we can find that by simply saying, if we are to consider the ratios, that uh, one is to two. So meaning here we must have twice uh, the number of moles that reacted here. So because we want to say 4.5 multiplied by two, which is supposed to be what? Nine, right? But then the change uh, again. So here it's supposed to be nine. And then here the ratio again, uh, the ratio is the same, two is to two. So same thing, 4.5 multiplied by two is a uh, nine and then to find the equilibrium on the reactant side if we want to find the equilibrium we say e is equals to i minus c so it's always the initial number of moles minus the change provided that the forward reaction is favored so here we are working with the fact that uh, the forward reaction is favored right so uh, this is going to be uh, 11 minus 9 which should give us 2 
but then here using the same i minus c this would have to be x minus 9 which will give us x minus 9 as an expression here but then remember getting to this point we must divide the number of moles by the volume here so it's 2 divided by what 0 0.5 which will give us what so this is 2 divided by 0 0.5 which will give us 4 and then here we have x minus uh, 9 divided by 0 0.5 which if you do that that's supposed to give you 2x minus uh, 80 right so you can quickly do that mainly why it gives you that if we can just work it out here this uh, is producing that from x uh, minus 9 uh, times so divided by half is the same as x minus 9 and then this will be multiplied by 2 we change this to a reciprocal so 2 over 1 so 2 times x is 2x and then 2 times negative 9 is a negative 18 so i hope that makes sense now why we got that so 2x minus 18 then okay now we come to a point whereby now we need to calculate our kc so let me uh, make this one bigger because i'll just be writing on top so okay if i want to calculate the kc now I would have to say so note that i'm not calculating the kc actually they said calculate the initial mode of h plus so we want to calculate x we are looking for the value of x we are already given the equilibrium constant kc it's 0 0.09 so as you can see here then therefore we need to say kc is equals to the concentration of the product cr207 and then a uh, two minus over the concentration of the reactants. So let's take a concentration of CrO4 two minus, and then because our ratio is two, that becomes the exponent. And then here we have the concentration of the hydrogen ion and then again the ratio is two so we use that as an exponent now for kc we substitute that 0 0.09 right and then what's the value that we have here it's nine so we want to have our nine here over uh, the concentration of this is 2x minus 8 and then square and then the concentration of h plus we can see it's four there so that's four square right now quick way to do math here if you want to get rid of this square here so we can see square and square we can just square both sides so we know this is the math that they, they do not provide even in the memo so you have to be very slick here in terms of doing your math so if you square both sides this will only give you 0 0.3 but then we know nine inside the square root this is giving you three and then uh, if we if we square this one it's only going to destroy the two here so that's 2x minus uh, 8 mi minus 18 and then uh, here also again the square root will just take out the two there so we'll be left with four right now at this point we can try to cross multiply this so i'm just i'm just going to say four multiplied by 0 comma three which will give me a uh, so if I say 4 multiplied by 0, 0,3, this will give me 1,2. And then I still maintain my 2x minus 18. And then this is equals to 3. Now, again, I need to be very quick with my maths. So it's 1.2 both sides, right? So I'm trying to, to solve it in such a way that I will not, having, I will not end up having this uh, long sum to deal with. So here I have that. And then let me just immediately transpose that minus 18 because we know what is going to happen here. This cancels and then we have a solution to this one. It's 2,5 and then plus 18. So immediately I take the minus 18 over to that side. So 2x is equals to 20.5. If I divide both sides by 2, then uh, my x is supposed to be 10.25 mole, right? So that's how you were supposed to solve that. That's how you were supposed to solve that. So that's how you find your value for x there. 
So it was supposed to be 10.25. So initially, the number of moles of the hydrogen ion was 10.25 mole. Okay, so done with KC. So I hope you also uh, got that one in the back. But then uh, if you didn't, you still have a chance to practice more and more so that in your final exam, it doesn't dribble you. Okay, so now let's look at uh, question seven. It says a solution of carbonic acid has a pH of 4.2 and the following Ka value. And then a, a solution of sulfuric acid has the following Ka value. So the Ka value for carbonic acid is 4.30 times 10 to the exponent of negative 7. Uh, and the sulfuric acid is 1.0 times 10 to the exponent of 3, right? So we can see that the Ka value for sulfuric acid is greater than the Ka value for the carbonic acid. So which means sulfuric acid will have to be a stronger acid but then a carbonic acid, a weaker acid. Then calculate the concentration of the hydronium ions in the carbonic acid solution, three marks. So this should be a straightforward question. So we just go pH is equals to negative log and then hydronium ions. So we have 4.2 here, and then it's equals to log H3O plus now, according to our rules of logs, we know that there is a 10 here. So this is supposed to be 10 to the exponent of negative. So we take this negative uh, along with the exponent there. And then when we punch that into our calculator, it is supposed to give us a concentration of H3O plus ion is 6.31 times 10 to the exponent of negative 5 mole per dm cube right and then a uh, 7.1.2 they say how will the strength of the carbonic acid compare to that of sulfuric acid if both acids have a concentration of 0 0.02 mole per dm cube now write only that the carbonic acid is stronger than weaker than or the same as sulfuric acid give a reason for the answer now according to our ka values there we can tell that it is weaker than weaker than. So why? Because uh, carbonic acid carbonic acid has a lower Ka value. So carbonic acid has a lower Ka value as compared to the Ka value of the sulfuric acid. Right. So we needed to just compare with our Ka values there, which is determining the strength of the acid. Okay, then uh, 7.2 says a solution of vinegar can be neutralized with a solution of sodium hydroxide. The reaction takes place according to the following balanced equation. So we can see the balanced equation as follows there. The sodium acetate produced, so the sodium acetate produced, meaning this here is the sodium acetate because they're saying it's produced. Uh, during this reaction can undergo hydrolysis so define the term hydrolysis now you do not define it the same way as we do in substitution here hydrolysis means that this is a a reaction of a salt with water right with water so that means this a uh, sodium acetate is the salt now 7.2.2 they say will the ph of the sodium acetate solution be greater than or less than seven right now the sodium acetate would have to be a base and then a uh, meaning that it must have a ph that is greater than seven so that's greater than seven now, in 7.2.3, they're saying explain the answer to question 7.2.2 by referring to a balanced equation. So to prove that it is basic, uh, let's check. So the solution there will be basic. So CHCOONA, if we react it with water through that hydrolysis. So remember, what is hydrolysis? When you react a salt with water, and then what will it produce? It will produce so 
Normally, your water here would act as an acid, and then that means it would have to be donated here. But then this will ionize, and then the Na, the sodium ion there, will, will be removed. So we'll have COOH, and then plus, if the sodium ion is removed, we are left with OH here. So the cation always uh, attracts to the N ion there. So NaOH. Now, considering that uh, our Na there remains a spectator ion, so the Na there remains a spectator ion, we can simply remove that Na there. If we remove that sodium ion, we are left with COO minus and then plus H2 to give us CH3COOH and then plus OH minus, right? Now, the fact that we have OH minus there, the fact that we have OH minus should be evident enough that this is basic, right? So the solution is basic. And if the solution is basic, we know that the pH has to be greater than 7 because according to our pH scale, 7 is neutral. And then all the way down there uh, up until 0, the, we say it is acidic. And then B above 7, it is a uh, basic, right? So if we are saying this salt is basic, then it has to have a pH that is greater than 7. So the solution is basic. So remember, it's a solution when you now react it with, with water. Okay, so that's all you were supposed to do there. And then let's proceed. Now we have 7.3. It says an unknown carbonate has a chemical formula of Y2CO3. Elena is asked to identify element X. So we must identify what element is uh, element Y meant to say. We must identify what is element Y there. So element Y cannot be found in the periodic table. Therefore, we have to identify it through calculations, right? So Y here, it's more like it's an unknown. Then the learner adds 0 0.5865 gram of the carbonate, this unknown carbonate, in a conical flask containing 25 centimeter cube volume, hydrochloric acid solution with a concentration of 0 0.3 mole per dm cube. The balanced equation for the reaction takes place as follows. Now they say the hydrochloric acid is in excess. Okay. Now, what are we supposed to do here? This is a three question. We know formula, substitution, correct answer. Calculate the initial mole of hydrochloric acid in the conical flask. So uh, for that question, we already have the volume and the concentration. So it's just C is equals to N over V. Our concentration is 0 0.3. We don't have the number of moles, but the volume here, we can divide this by 1,000 gives us 0 0.025. And then if we cross multiply there, this is supposed to give us a, let's punch that into our calculator, 0 0.01. So we're just going to round off to two decimal places. Right. And then 7.3.2 uh, says uh, we have a statement here which relates to this question uh, below here. Once the mixture has stopped fizzing, right, so 15 centimeter cube of a 0 0.1 mole dm cube of sodium hydroxide is added to the mixture to neutralize any remaining hydrochloric acid. So it is to neutralize the excess hydrochloric acid, meaning the final solution of the hydrochloric acid. I want you to understand that. Right. So we know our calculation when it comes to this. 7.3.2 says calculate the amount of hydrochloric acid in mole that did what? Reacted. Now, if we want to find the number of moles reacted, we know that uh, we say number of moles initial minus the number of moles final. Right. So that means in other words, we must figure out the initial which we did calculate. Remember, this one was the initial number of moles, meaning we must figure out the final number of moles of what? Of the hydrochloric acid. Note that here we are only given uh, the number of moles 
I mean the, the volume and concentration for the sodium hydroxide. So we need to use the sodium hydroxide in order to find the hydrochloric acid. But at the end of the day, this is the formula that we should uh, work with, right? So let's save it for later. Okay, so starting with our question 7.3.2, we are going to say, okay, we are given volume and concentration of sodium hydroxide. So to calculate number of moles of sodium hydroxide, we can say that's concentration multiplied by volume. So from manipulating this formula here, our concentration 0 0.1, volume, again, we have to divide this by 1,000, so which is 0 0.015, and then if you multiply here, that's 0 0.015, uh, 0 0.0015. So I'm not going to round off because it's not the final answer. But then uh, what is uh, the ratio of the sodium hydroxide to the hydrochloric acid? If we are to react the two, sodium hydroxide and HCl, they always react like this. So they will produce sodium chloride and water, which this one is a balanced equation. But then here we can see that the ratio is a ratio of one is to one. So that means step number two is to compare the molar ratio. So ratio of sodium hydroxide to the ratio of HCl is one is to one, which means that the number of moles of HCl final right final or in excess will have to be what will also have to be 0 0.0 uh, 0 0.015 mole right then uh, which now makes it easy if we want uh, if we want the number of moles reacted then there we go with our formula what was the number of moles initially so initially we had 0 0.01 then finally in excess, 0 0.0015. And then if you subtract the two here, uh, this is supposed to give you 0 0.0085 mole. Right. So that's all you needed to do for that four marks. So three stoichiometric steps, calculate the number of moles, use the molar ratio, and then calculate for the required value. But then you always have to remember this formula here to calculate number of moles reacted is initial minus final. Now 7.3.3 says identify element Y. So we want to identify element Y. And then uh, from here, we can see that uh, in the ratio of this year hcl number of moles of hcl to the number of moles of this unknown carbonate is a uh, two is to one but then remember from the previous question here we had already calculated the number of moles of hydrochloric acid that reacted with this unknown carbonate right and then uh, we did calculate and then we found that it was 0 0.00 eight five and then that means we have x here to calculate x let's cross multiply here divide by two divide by two my x is equals two is uh, 0 0.00425 mole so you don't want to round off here you can write it in scientific mode that would be 4.25 times 10 so that's point of negative three but then a uh, refrain from having to round off before you arrive at the final answer, right? So now you have the number of moles, meaning we can calculate the molar mass. Remember, we are given the mass of this unknown carbonate, right? So we can then say N is equals to mass over the molar mass. And then our number of moles, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0,00425 is equals to the mass is 0 0.5865 over uh, M. So if we want to calculate the molar mass, that's 0 0.5865 divided by 0 0.00425. And then your molar mass is equals to what? 138 grams per mole, right? But then remember, we are only interested in having to find element one. So what we can do here is 
we can say this part we are given. So let's just calculate uh, the relative molecular mass of carbo. Uh, what is this of the carbonate, right? So we can say that's 12 plus 3 times 16. And then this is going to give us 60 grams per mole. Now, what are we going to do? Remember, this is the molar mass of this whole compound, 138 grams per mole. And the 60 gram per mole only speaks for this. So that means if we want to find the molar mass of Y2, then it's simply 138 grams per mole minus the 60 grams per mole, right? If we only want to find this, remember, having to add the molar masses of each and every element here gives us 138 grams per mole. So if we only want to find the Y2 there, we can all agree that we have to take the total molar mass minus the molar mass of the carbonate there. And then this is going to give us 78 grams per mole. But then note that Y2 here is a diatomic molecule. So it's a diatomic molecule. Diatomic molecule are uh, more like your H2, your Cl2, your O2, right? So there's two of these elements that make up this molecule. So that means if we only want to find an element, what would we do? Obviously, that's 78 divided by 2, right? And then 78 divided by 2, this gives us 39 grams per mole. So that's your solution right there, 39 grams per mole. But then remember, it was not to calculate, the question was not to calculate uh, the molar mass only, it was to identify. So this is where now you go back, to, you go to your periodic table, and then if you go to your periodic table, uh, you will find that the one with 39 grams per mole there is potassium, is the one that is indicated by K. So this is potassium. So therefore, in other words, uh, the Y2, they represent potassium. So in other words, what you have there is K2CO3, potassium carbonate. So this is potassium carbonate. Okay, so yeah, that was a pretty interesting question. Okay, so we have question eight, um, galvanic cells. A galvanic cell is constructed as shown in the diagram below. And then for 8.1.1, they say which electrode is cathode, right? Only nickel or cadmium. So we know what to do in order to find uh, the cathode. From our 4B table, we just have to check which one appears a second. So we have our, cad our cadmium here. And then we have our nickel just below. So we know the one that appears the first is a node, and then the one that appears second is cathode, right? So that means uh, your cathode would have to be nickel, right? Then uh, from here, we have a... Uh, 8.1.2 says write down the equation for the oxidation half reaction of this cell. Now, if we have already stated that this is cathode, then that means this right here is a node, right? And then remembering our red cat and ox, we know that in the anode, we have to have oxidation. So our oxidation half reaction will come from this. And then where are we going to take it? again from that 4b table so our 4b table here will show us uh, the cadmium there is it but then if it's anode oxidation we have to write it in this manner here from here all the way uh, we flip the equation so this is supposed to be cd oxidizes to cd 2 plus ion plus 2e so it loses two electrons there. So that's how you're supposed to write it. That's the notation. And then write down with that one. Okay. Now let's move to 8.1.3. It says, how will the reading on the voltmeter be affected if the concentration of the nickel ions is increased uh, 
after the sale has reached equilibrium. Now, I did state that if they are increasing the concentration on the cathode side, then it leads to our E cell increasing because E cell is directly proportional to the E cathode, right? Even if you look at the formula here to calculate E cell, you'll see E cell is equals to E cathode minus E anode. And then you will always observe that whenever you increase the cathode, obviously the E cell has to increase as well, right? So our answer to our answer to 8.1.3 is supposed to be increase, right? And then, uh, but the reason that we give for that one is that uh, when we increase, so when we increase the concentration of the Ni2 plus ions, the forward reaction is favored. So the forward reaction is favored. So if the forward reaction is favored, then we know that uh, this leads to an increase in the E cell or in the EMF reading of uh, the, the cell, right? Then uh, 8.2 says, initially consider the following standard electrochemical cell and then we are given all of that. And then uh, they say initially each, ha each half cell contains 200 centimeter cube electrolyte. The cell is connected to a circuit and allowed to produce current until the concentration of the electrolyte in the cathode half cell is reduced to 0 0.5 mole per dm cube. The cell is then disconnected. Write a balanced equation for the net ionic cell reaction. So we know for that one, uh, we need to start with our oxide half reaction. And then given the, sol the cell notation here, we always know that the cell notation starts with the anode. And then after the salt bridge, we have the cathode, right? So from the anode side to the cathode side. And then this is how we are supposed to write this. So our oxide half reaction, this is where we have, a uh, remember again, red cat and ox, red cat and ox. So on the anode, we have oxidation. So our oxidation is Cu oxidizes to Cu2 plus ion plus uh, two electrons. So meaning that uh, we have a loss of two electrons and then it oxidized to Cu2 plus ions. And then reduction half, this is where we have our Ag plus ion reducing to Ag, right? Because it gains an electron. So now we have our oxide half a reaction and our red half reaction. But then in order to come about with the cell reaction, we know that we have to make sure that our electrons are balanced. So how do we do that? We simply going to multiply this by two, right? So obviously here, multiply by one is still going to be the same. So this is two and then two here and two there. At this point, when the number of electrons are equal, then you can just cancel them off and then drop all you have on the left-hand side to the left. So that's Cu plus 2Ag plus and drop all that you have on the right-hand side to the right. Then you have Cu2 plus plus uh, 2Ag, right? Now you can uh, indicate the state if you want to show that so this is aquas aquas and then here we have a solid right but then you wouldn't be penalized for not showing the state then 8.2.2 says calculate the concentration of the electrolyte in the anode half cell when the cell is disconnected i have to say when i saw a calculation question uh, of this nature in your galvanic cell I was also alarmed, right? So uh, this is very unusual. No past paper could have prepared you for this misery here. Then calculate the concentration, <laughs> calculate the concentration of the electrolyte in the anode half cell when the cell is disconnected. So, okay, this is for seven marks, right? So what you needed to uh, first do here is understand that here we have the anode 
and then here we have the cathode now we will need the balanced equation for that so let's write it again we have our cu plus 2ag plus to yield cu2 plus plus 2ag right and then we are told that uh, initially each half cell contains 200 centimeter cube electrolyte the cell is connected to a circuit and allowed to produce current until the concentration of the electrolyte in the cathode half cell is reduced to 0 0.5 mole per dm cube so that means a uh, the whole reaction now ends up favoring the reverse reaction which is why we see the cathode here the the number of the concentration of the cathode decreasing and then obviously if the concentration of the cathode decreases we have to have an increase in the concentration of the anode because in this case uh, the reverse reaction would be the one that is favored now they say calculate the concentration of the electrolyte in the anode so we should calculate the one in the anode half cell when the cell is disconnected now uh, the 0 0.5 mole per dm cube here relates to the cathode so we want to start by saying cathode and try to calculate for the cathode now the cathode we do understand that it is for this one here where we have the equation cu to a uh, not that one uh, the ag sorry so the cathode is this one here so where we have ag plus and then your electron so where we have the reduction uh, half now we can start by calculating the number of moles of the electrolyte there which is the ag plus ion right so we know that the electrolyte contains the ag plus ion so we might just as well calculate the number of moles of ag plus ion then this is supposed to be c times v because we are given the concentration and the volume right now what is the concentration that's a uh, 0 0.5 and then the volume we are aware that we need to uh, divide this by 1000 so so to convert it to dm cube so it's going to be 0 0.2 and then now when we calculate here we have 0 0.1 mole so that means 0 0.1 mole actually reacted of this so this is the reacted uh, number of moles of the ag plus ion but then if we are to compare it uh, to the ratio of the cu the copper right so this is what we have here on the cathode we have the ag plus here and then obviously uh, our electrode is ag and then we have our salt bridge like that then right here on the anode we have our cu2 plus and then this here is cu right so now if we are moving if we want to move to the anode side we will compare the number of moles of ag plus to the number of moles of the electrode there which is the anode and then from our balanced equation here we can see that this is two is two one so we want to find the number of moles of copper that reacted so we are still comparing this reactants here so we want to find the number of moles of copper that reacted with the ag plus ion so i hope you are following here and then we have 0 0.1 this here is x so we can quickly calculate that by cross multiplying here and then divide by 2 divide by 2 the x is 0 0.05 mole right and then this is the number of moles of copper that reacted right so this is the number of moles of copper that reacted but note that we are interested in the electrolyte so the electrolyte of copper has what has the copper two plus ion so now when we arrive to the anode we will say let's compare the the ratio of the number of moles of the copper to the number of moles of the copper two plus ion and then from our balanced equation again we can see that the ratio is one is to one meaning that the number of moles of copper that reacted are the same number of moles of copper two plus ion that actually were uh, released right so released into the uh, anode into the electrolyte because here what we have is oxidation right so this is 
the ones that oxidized it's 0.05 mole as well so the copper two plus ions that oxidized are those now what are they saying they're saying calculate the concentration of the electrolyte of the anode half cell now when we have when we have that we can then calculate the concentration to say okay we now have the 0 0.05 there mole and then now let's calculate the concentration of the cu2 plus but then this concentration that we are going to calculate is the one initial so before uh before this cell was disconnected right so initially uh we can say that initially we must maintain that we must have a concentration of one mole per dm cube so let's calculate the number of moles we have there the concentration let's calculate the number of moles initial so that's c times v so that's one multiplied by the volume of 0 0,2 right so we'll start by calculating number of moles and then this is supposed to be 0 0,2 mole right so initially these are the number of moles that we have but then the ones that reacted is 0 0.05 mole now, in order to find the number of moles finally, remember these ones are the ones that came about as a result of uh, the cathode here being reduced to 0 0.5 mole per dm cube. So the final one would have to be the initial number of moles of the copper 2 plus ion plus the ones here that reacted, so which is 0 0.05, the ones that were released. And then now when we add these ones, it's 0 0.25 mole right now what are we going to do with this 0 0.25 mole this is what we are supposed to do right remember we are looking for the concentration so to find the concentration we must then say our formula is c is equals to n over v remember now we have the number of moles final which is the 0 0.2 initially that the anode had plus the 0 0.05 that came from the cathode right so now we will say 0 0.25 and then over our volume here of 200 centimeter cubes so it's still 0 0.2 and then when you divide those ones we get 1.25 mole per dm cube so that's how you got to that seven mark there that's how you were supposed to go through uh, that question in order to uh, get all that seven mark so yeah this was a pretty crazy question uh, i feel like no exam paper no past paper could have prepared you for this so it was just a question whereby you needed to be creative just right there in the in your in your exam hall but then uh, if you manage to get uh, up until a certain point you can then uh, look at your memo and see the marks that you would have been awarded yeah but then this would have to go down as the question of the century very nice one okay so we have question nine an electrolytic cell it says electrolysis is generally used in industry to produce chemicals through the decomposition of compounds the breaking down of compounds the simplified diagram below represents an electrolytic cell used in the electrolysis of a concentrated sodium chloride solution. Right. So note that 9.1 here says define the term anode in terms of oxidation or reduction. So we know that uh, from NOx, we know that uh, the anode is the electrode where oxidation takes place where oxidation takes place right and then now 9.2 says which electrode x or y is connected to the positive terminal of the power source give a reason for the ant now this was more of a cell that uh, used to appear higher your COVID yes and then uh, there are a couple of things that you might need to know here we have your NACL here 
which will go through in here and then ionize to Na plus and then Cl minus, right? In most of the cases with this type of set here, you usually have where your sodium chloride uh, is, where you have your sodium chloride being the positive, uh, the positive terminal representing the anode. And then you have this side here where usually the compound that is uh, introduced into this cell is usually your water. And then this here happens to be the cathode side and is always the negative terminal. As you know, the anode is positive and the cathode is negative in an electrolytic cell. Right. So these are just a basic fact. And then from here, you need to understand that the anode here is positive and therefore will attract all the anions. So the Cl minus will be more attracted to the anode side, but then the Na plus ion here would have to go through this uh, membrane here and then be attracted to the cathode side. So this is where we'll have our Na plus, but then also our H2O will have to ionize to OH minus and H plus. And then again, this here is an anion, would have to be attracted towards the anode uh, electrode. And then the H plus here would have to be attracted towards the cathode uh, electrode, right? Because it is connected to the positive terminal. So note, it is connected to the negative terminal, meant to say. So note that if it's positive, it's a cation. It is connected to the negative terminal. And if it is an anion, negative ion, it is uh, attracted to the positive terminal, right? And then when it comes to the gases that are extracted out here, from here, the gas that will be extracted out is the chlorine gas. And then from this side here, the gas that is extracted out is your hydrogen gas. Now, the membrane here is for the purpose of uh, to maintain that the Cl2 here does not react with sodium because we know in most of the cases, your sodium here ion uh, tends to react with your chlorine. So this membrane here is to separate this two. Uh, so it doesn't make, it doesn't actually make it into a, a galvanic cell. It is still a one cell, but then just that they introduce that uh, membrane here just to make sure that the Na plus ions do not react with the chlorine gas that we are trying to extract out or collect there. Okay, so those are the basic facts that you needed to know in order to uh, then answer the questions in here. 9.2 says electrode X or Y is connected to the positive terminal of the power source. Uh, what electrode is it X or Y that is connected to the positive terminal of the power source? Give a reason for the answer. And as we have already established here, the positive uh, terminal would have to be X here, which is representing the anode. So your 9.2, you're going to say X. And then your reason is because the chlorine ions, which is Cl minus, uh, is attracted to the positive terminal, right? is attracted to the positive terminal. So because the chlorine is going there, it tells us that it has been attracted by positive terminal there. Then 9.3 says, write down the name or chemical formula of gas A. So the gas that is collected there is your chlorine gas. So for 9.3.1, you wanna say Cl2 or you write in words chlorine gas. So they said name or chemical formula. And then compound C, the compound C there is a H2O, which is, a, if you write it in terms of the name, it's water, right? Then 9.4 says, write down the equation for the half reaction that takes place at the cathode. We have already established that this here is the cathode, but then uh, in terms of which one, note that here we have our H2O, right? So that means the reaction that is supposed to happen here Remember, we have the one for H2O, and then we have, and then uh, the ions that we have are Na plus and H plus. There, now it becomes a battle between which one should we actually take, right? And then from here, 
Remember, on the cathode, we are looking for the oxidizing agent. So we want the one that is a stronger oxidizing agent. Right. Now, if we were to compare between the sodium uh, ion, which is this one here, and then compare it to the one that goes uh, H2O there, we can see that the oxidizing agent increases going down the table. So this here would have to be a stronger oxidizing agent, meaning that the reaction that is most likely to occur there is the one uh, for H2O, right? So 2H2O plus 2E to produce uh, your hydrogen gas there that will be collected plus 2OH minus. So this is the reaction that is most likely to occur because uh, it represents that H2O is a much more stronger oxidizing agent so therefore it is the one that will be reduced on the cathode side uh, as compared to the na plus now the next question here is asking us to explain that refer to the relative strength of the oxidizing agent to explain the answer to question 9.4 so i've already tried to explain all you are supposed to do here is uh, explain this by saying so what question is that uh, 9.5 so this was 9.4 so we want to explain that by saying that h2o is a stronger oxidizing agent oxidizing agent than in comparison to what to na plus ion than na plus ion Right. Therefore, H2O will be reduced right, to the hydrogen gas that will be collected there. So that's how you are supposed to explain this. Now, uh, we already know how marks are awarded there. So how many marks is that one? Three marks. So usually, uh, they give two marks for having to compare here. So just to tell us H2O is a strong oxidizing agent, then Na plus, uh, it should be a mark. And then having to conclude that therefore H2O will be reduced to H2. That's a mark, right? So that's how you were supposed to go about uh, answering those questions. So uh, there was a bit of a stretch with this kind of question here uh, because uh, your curriculum had been relaxed after COVID. And then we cut your teachers or maybe yourselves also kind of have forgot about this type of cell here. So yeah, this is a, take it as a, le a learning curve to say that uh, your curriculum is now has, has now been established to its full strength. And therefore you still need to practice using those uh, maybe 2015, 2016 past papers in order to see uh, the questions that were there. But then with all that being said, guys, we have came to the end of the lesson. Uh, we have completed all this question paper. As we can see, total 150 marks. So make sure you press the thumbs up button if you have enjoyed the lesson and then have found it helpful. And if you've been watching the videos and haven't subscribed yet, you know what to do. Please smash that subscribe button. But most importantly, Please share the link with your friends and classmates so that they may also find assistance. Remember, do not be selfish. We are winning as a team.